Yeah, um, shouldn't we, like, learn by... Playing the game. That's what this sack of wrenches is for. If you can dodge a wrench... You can play Stellaris. Montu. Are you sure that this is completely necessary? Uh, necessary? Is it necessary for me to drink my own urine? Probably not. No, but I do it anyway because it's sterile and I like the taste. Okay. Welcome to my advanced guide for Stellaris 3.0. The main focus of this episode is the galactic community and species rights. For a full list of chapters, check out the description below. Welcome back to the Orthethi Interplanetary Assembly. The year is 2238. We now have a whole host of worlds under our control. We have eight worlds across three different sectors. That's mainly due to the fact that we just uh, conquered three planets from a rather troublesome neighbor that had the audacity of going to war with us. So that was all in all a successful war. And now let's dive in and keep playing. So we've conquered a new world and that new world has new species on it. So what we should really do is take a look at species rights. So I'm gonna to go to species rights. It's the tab on the bottom left here. And what have I got? Well, let's look at setting the species rights of this new species that have arrived. What are my options? Well, unfortunately, I'm a little bit limited in my options due to the fact that I am both xenophile and I am egalitarian. Both of these traits will limit the uh, somewhat uh, more productive things I could do with my pops, shall we say. For instance, I can't make them slaves. However, let's take a look at that. So first off at the top here, full citizenship, I'm going to be keeping that unless I was a xenophobe, in which case I could only make them residents. Even then, due to the happiness malice, I'd actually recommend making most species full citizenship unless you're trying to do some sort of role play thing. I just don't think it's worth it otherwise. Uh, then next we're on to living standards. So what are our options? Well, we have decent conditions. That's what we're on now. We could also go to utopian abundance as an egalitarian uh, civilization. That would mean that unemployed pops have no negative modifier to happiness. Both utopian abundance and social welfare share that trait. Whereas the other ones, you're going to get a minus 20% happiness, for instance, for academic privilege, basic conditions, etc. if you are unemployed. So Utopian Abundance, you're going to be spending a lot, and I really do mean a lot here, on consumer good upkeep. It goes from being 0.25 for workers up to one times. It's a fourfold increase. Yes, you're getting a big increase in happiness, but you really don't want unemployed pops, so you really don't want them to be producing these research and unity points. To be quite frank, you'd, you'd much rather have researchers uh, doing that or technocracy to be research and unity. So yes, there's cases where you could get this, but overall, I'd probably keep with the decent conditions if I was looking to maximize. On top of that social welfare, well, I'm going to be doubling the consumer good usage of my workers and all I'm getting is a 10% bonus to happiness there. Again, I really don't think that's worth the extra use, extra consumer goods you would need. Now, on the other hand, basic subsistence, well, I can't do that because they're not slaves and they're not residents. But really, I wouldn't recommend setting any slaves to this level because you're going to be dealing with massive levels of unhappiness if you have this. On the other hand, if I was authoritarian, stratified economy is fantastic. It's going to massively increase the political power of my rulers and massively increase their happiness, meaning if I've got any slaves and any workers on my planet, there shouldn't be really any issues to stability and happiness because of that massive political power of my very happy rulers. The other great living standard that I, I think we should talk about here is academic privilege. That's going to do something similar to stratified economy in that I'm going to be getting big bonuses to my ruler, but also specialist happiness. However, it will double the consumer good upkeep of my specialists, which is not so great. If you can handle that extra consumer good upkeep as a materialist, academic privilege is very powerful. It does also give you a bonus to your uh, research as well just straight out of the door. So that that's pretty good. 
In terms of military service, uh, to be quite honest, I would recommend setting only to full military service or soldiers. If you exempt a species, the only thing that will happen is they won't work, won't work soldier jobs and you can't use them to produce armies. Not so useful. Colonization rights. In order to use a, if you have a migration pack to settle with a foreign species on your uh, planet, you need to make sure that in the default rights you set colonization allowed as a default. Otherwise you can't uh, build a colony ship with one of these foreign species that you have a migration pact with. Otherwise, if you set this to forbidden, you simply can't build colony ships with that species type. Population controls. If you enable these, I can't do so due to my xenophile preference, but if you do, there will be no growth for that species. But they do get a big minus 10 uh, malice to your happiness. I'd actually recommend you set preferred species growth for a specific species rather than enabling this population control. Yes, you're going to get a minus 10% malice to pop growth, but I would say this happiness negative, if you've got a big planet full of these pops, is going to be quite a bit of an issue. Following that migration control. So if you are a player that, let's say, you don't like uh, mixing your vegetables and your meat, you don't like it when the peas touch the broccoli, you probably won't like it when one foreign species starts growing on all of your worlds. To stop that, you have to enable migration controls. That means that no species will start growing on a planet where the species doesn't already exist in your empire uh, for each species you set this as. And also, if a planet only has species with migration controls enabled living on that planet, well, it will both produce no emigration and have no immigration too. Uh, but most of the time you want to set this to no migration controls because you want auto resettlement, you want a lot of these nice things. Let's have a little think on slavery. So there are some important slavery types to mention. There is of course chattel slavery, that's going to give us a minus 30% happiness, but it will give us a plus 10% bonus to the worker output of all your slaves doing worker jobs. In addition, your slaves will only be able to be working in worker jobs but that 10% bonus can be really good. That's a really useful one to have. However, there is another type of slavery, indentured servitude. Now that is going to give you a minus 50% to political power, whereas chattel is quite a bit more, but you're only getting minus 20% happiness. And in addition, you can work specialist jobs, which is really powerful. That means you can have slaves on a planet and they can work both the worker and specialist jobs. Something to note as of 3.0, when they're working specialist jobs, they no longer get any bonuses that are applied to slave resource output. They only get specialist resource output benefits, but you will still be on very low upkeep, zero, zero consumer good upkeep probably. However, there is a third type too, and that is domestic servitude. Now, domestic servitude lets your slaves become entertainers as well as workers. And if they're unemployed, they take the servant position, which produces, I think, four amenities. I'm going to say off the top of my head, four amenities. And that means that if you use, uh, if you set some species to be that way, you can, uh, in essence, conquer a planet, if they are all set to domestic servitude, you're not going to have the issues that I'm currently facing with low amenities and then low stability. There are two tabs here, two important tabs. There's a set rights and set default rights. So if I set default rights, that is the rights for a species not currently in my empire. And that means when that species comes in, they'll get the default rights. And then even a month later, I can change what their rights are in the set rights for that specific species. So if you've got slaves, I'd probably recommend you do something like have domestic servitude set as the default rights. Specifically, if you're conquering planets or you're conquering primitives, having domestic servitude pops will make it really easy in the initial days to keep your stability up to prevent any sort of rebellion or any sort of issue there. And then once you've got all of your pops employed, you've no longer got any servant roles, then you could transition them over to chattel servitude or indentured servitude, depending on what you really want. For machine empires, grid amalgamation is critical because it allows you to have big, big, big energy upkeep from bio pops that you conquer. In essence, you can plug them into the matrix and it's great. Purge type, I'm not going to go through. 
However, I'm just going to say that purge can be quite important for aggressive species um, and you want to be careful with when purging because as you purge a species, depending on the purge type, you'll force refugees. And as refugees move to neighboring empires, if they have their refugee policy set to accept these refugees, uh, those refugees will be granting intel on your empire to your neighbor possibly or whoever gets this pop. And that is 10 intel per pop usually, something in that margin. So it is very, very easy to get near perfect intel on a determined exterminator or something like that elsewhere in the galaxy if you simply go to your policies and make sure that you have set refugees to refugees welcome. Something else that should be looked at now as well is my star base layout and my trade value. So let's take a look at uh, some trade value and some star base layout. Well, I've gained two new star bases from this war. But on top of that, or I've, I've gained one even, sorry. But on top of that, I've also gained the ability to upkeep an extra because I've gone over a threshold. For every 10 systems you have, you get to have an extra owned star base. Now, yeah, I am 25% over upkeep, but every single one of my star bases has a hydroponics bay, which is producing 10 food. I can trade that food. I mean, at the moment, I'm actually, I've got very few workers producing food. So if I were to remove a star base, I think, cost-wise it would be more costly to kill one of these star bases which is actually they have quite a low upkeep even with that plus 25 percent there we are I'm at only at 2.1 per month but let's look at trade route and trade value so i go to trade routes for instance i can see first off that this raptor station isn't connected to my network so what do i want to do i want to connect it to my network but i want to select where it goes so i can either send it to the closest station or I could, send it, I could send it to any station or straight back to the capital. With this one, I know that uh, Perima here has uh, some of these hangar bays and gun batteries, so it's got some trade protection and in the adjacent systems, which means that any trade coming from here is going to be fine going all the way back there. But let's send it back. That's going to give us, we're sending 38 trade value there. That should help our income somewhat. You'll also notice I've got a bit of an issue with trade from this trade route here. It's going back to my capital, but it's going over a system with no trade protection. On the other hand, RIM over here, well, RIM is producing trade protection up to a range of two, but that doesn't include this system. So what can I do? I, I can't select my capital, but I can select a different system for it to go to. Now, if I look at RIM, I've got trade flowing in from Detrium and then flowing to my capital. If I unpause, I instantly lose all of the piracy I had in Berra, which was reducing my effective trade value, and could have got to the point where I was uh, where I was starting to spawn pirates. Something that isn't life-threatening, but you really don't want to happen. So my tech options have come up, and actually at the moment, I don't think I want any of these right now. Yes, I think what I'd actually like to roll for again is to try and get the droids technology or the alloy foundry technology. So what I'm going to do to ensure that is I'm going to re-roll. And what does that mean? I'm going to research a technology with the shortest amount of time I can. For instance, this coil gun technology. And then uh, as soon as that's finished, I will get a new set of technologies to choose from. So I will be able to hopefully have something new, something that I would prefer. I've also got another world here. It's at 60% habitability. That's not great. But as I'm building robots, I'm probably going to go down the synthetic ascension path. I can get an easy plus 20 here from habitability. So I am actually going to colonize this with some of my primary species. I've got the resources. It's a simple decision. So what I'm doing here is I'm offering communications to a neighbor in order to make sure that I meet as many as people as possible. That way I can hopefully form the galactic community soon. So we've met, fantastic, we've met another species. Let's, we've met two actually. Brilliant. Let's see if we can get some more communications from one of them. So I can see that they definitely have some species that they know about because it's got a negative malice here. So obviously they know the information is worthwhile. So I'm going to simply give them some extra energy and then I'll be able to pick it up. And I waited a little bit to actually buy this tradition. I've now got quite a lot of unity saved up, but that's mainly because I waited some time before uh, my new administrative buildings were finished. So I had some more bureaucrats to reduce this empire sprawl. 
now I can buy it at a low cost and my next edition is only going to be a few months away. And I've just discovered lots and lots and lots of species the galactic community should now form. And we've had the decision come up here. I would, if you want to be a member of the galactic community and want it to exist, say yes. And here we have it, the galactic community is formed. Let's dive into that and take a look. So the first thing we're going to see here is we have, on the left here, if I let it run for a little bit, the AI will start proposing uh, resolutions or laws to be passed and voted on in the galactic community. Here we go, Guardian Angels Act. That's a proposal. Now, at the end of the recess period, whichever proposal has the most support will be moved onto the Senate floor here. You can also see here on the right all of the different uh, civilizations in the galactic community. At the moment, there's only five, but actually in this galaxy, we have 11. I think the rest will join uh, as time goes on, but they're just not here yet. So I've got diplomatic weight. What can I do to increase my diplomatic weight in the galactic community? Because your diplomatic weight is key to passing resolutions. When you have a resolution on the floor, you either support it and your diplomatic weight goes to positive towards it or you oppose it and your diplomatic weight goes to the negative. Whichever side has the most diplomatic weight at the end is successful and the law is either passed or failed. Now, we then want to increase our diplomatic weight. The first thing we can do is we can assign. So here we will move this person in. Now, if I unpause, we've just gone up again. We're now the most powerful member of the, diplomat of the galactic community due to the extra bonuses we had from our envoys. But what else can we do to improve our diplomatic weight? Well, what we can do is we can go to policies and we can change our diplomatic stance. And now, at the beginning, I had it set to expansionist. That was fine. That was OK. I'm getting a small uh, increase to my colony development speed and a small reduction to my outpost build cost. But isolationist would have also been a really good one to start the game with. I would have got an extra 10% unity, so finished by traditions more quickly, and 15% more administrative capacity, which would have been good for both finishing those traditions and researching technology. Cooperative is what I'm probably going to change to now. That's going to give me a plus 25% diplomatic weight to the galactic community. But what else does it do? Well, if I am a tributary, if I am a subject to another empire and the relationship is that I am paying tribute, if I move from a regular diplomatic stance to cooperative, instead of paying 25% of my income each month for both energy and minerals, I'll only have to pay 10%, which is really fantastic if you want to build up your economy and build up your navy in order to strike back at the cruel and savage oppressors. On the other hand, belligerent, instead of reducing your uh, upkeep cost as a tribute, will double it from 25% to 50%. If you're a tributary, you really don't want to be belligerent. Now, there's also mercantile. If you're a megacorp, it's going to increase your diplomatic weight from trade value. That's all right, plus 25%. But the best uh, policy to increase your diplomatic weight is going to be the supremacist policy. Now, why is that? It increases your diplomatic weight from fleet power by 100%. Well, let's go in and take a look at this. So if it increases your fleet power by 100%, that means the diplomatic weight from fleet power. That means not only will it benefit from uh, increasing that, but any modifiers like the envoys will also further increase your diplomatic weight from fleet power. As long as you have some fleet, as long as your fleet represents at least 20 to 25 percent, depending on what envoys you have and, and other such bonuses, your diplomatic weight, supremacist is always going to be preferable to cooperative. Further on and later in the game, as your fleets get bigger and bigger, you're going to find that your diplomatic weight from fleet power vastly outweighs that from pops, economy and technology. So with supremacists, you can have both military dominance and political dominance. But what do we do with all of this power? Well, we use it to pass resolutions. What do resolutions do? They're kind of a couple of categories. There are laws. Uh, so there are these resolutions like the galactic commerce chain, industrial development chain. These will increase or decrease your diplomatic weight from a certain aspect, be that economy or pops, as well as providing some bonuses or negative modifiers to a vast array of things in the game. In addition to that, there are sanctions. Now, if you are in breach of galactic law, as some of these other resolutions uh, or laws have some things you must do not to be in breach of them, for instance, 
The Military Readiness Act, well that will mean if you have less than half of your naval capacity occupied with ships, you are going to be in breach of galactic law because every member of the galactic community must be ready for battle. And that will cause not only a reduction to your diplomatic weight, but it's also going to cause whatever sanctions are proposed to also negatively affect you as well. And the sanctions pretty much do what they say. The politics and culture will have a negative impact on your uh, administrative capacity, commerce and industry on economic uh, economic stuff. Uh, my research one's going to impact your research and technology. You get the drift. Now, what is important here? Well, I'm actually going to be proposing regulatory facilitation. That's both quite a good chain. It's going to be increasing my alloy and mineral production at the cost of habitability, at granted. But it will be increasing that and increasing my diplomatic weight from economy. My diplomatic weight from economy should be quite high compared to most of my neighbours. That's something I'm really going to be focusing on. And that will mean that as long as I keep up a high diplomatic weight from economy, I will benefit more from these laws passing than the other members of the community. It's always really important to keep in mind when you're voting for or against a law, not only if it benefits you, but how much it benefits you relative to other members of the galaxy. So for instance, if industrial development would benefit you, but it's going to develop, benefit another empire even more, you probably don't want to support it. Now, greater good, that's going to be uh, workers' rights. That's got some great stuff in there. And later on, you'll find that anyone that's not egalitarian is basically in breach of galactic law. Because of that, it's very difficult to get the computer to ever agree to, to pass this or even propose it. Uh, galactic commerce is going to improve your uh, trade value of, of, of all your planets, as well as increasing your bureaucrat upkeep and reducing naval capacity. And at the very end here, you can see it. It's got some big malices to happiness that you probably don't want to have. Ecological protection and unchained knowledge. Well, they're two sides of the... They're, so. Ecological protection and unchained knowledge. Well, ecological protection will reduce your diplomatic weight from the economy, but also be providing bonuses to food and habitability. Overall, I wouldn't recommend this one. Unchained knowledge, this is more of a research-based thing. When you get up to the very top, you can start using ZRO to fund extra dimensional research. Look out for that one. It can increase the chance of the unbidden forcing their way into your galaxy. But however, it's a great one to get to the end on. You're going to be getting great bonuses to research. Divinity of life, on the other hand, that is uh, something you need to be passing if there is a very powerful player empire or empire in the galaxy with a significant technology advantage that are using that diplomatic weight from technology to lord it over the rest of you with laws. You need to band together and start banning those soulless robots. Later on, when you get far enough down this path, you're going to find machine empires and those that have gone through synthetic evolution are either getting negative modifiers or outright being banned. So it's a, you have to be careful with that one. Of course, there's the space whale policies. Vote for them, don't vote for them. The AI loves these. Generally, I don't think they have much impact outside of flavor, but they're kind of cool. Mutual defense. Well, this one is all about uh, having a strong galactic community and enabling the galactic community to declare special types of wars as you go down it, which can be really cool. Uh, on top of that, you're going to massively increase your diplomatic weight from fleet power and you're going to increase everyone's naval capacity. The flip side to that is rules of war, which is going to start banning your Death Stars. It's terrible. Vote no. Vote no on prop anti-Death Star. You know, you... Yeah, just... Oh. And finally here we've got Form Galactic Market. Now, that's a really interesting one. Sometimes it's really good. It does increase your resource storage capacity. The one thing you need to be careful here is that there's only one empire going to be benefiting from the reduction in market uh, cost. Because obviously you've got this market fee on the galactic market. Only the, the empire which houses the galactic market will have that. And you'll also lose your internal market. When you lose your internal market, it'll mean you're at the whim of, un, uh, of other empires as to how prices rise and fall. At the moment, as long as I manage the uh, buying and selling in my empire, I can make sure that prices don't hyperinflate or don't crash through the floor, which, you know, means that I am able to maintain a healthy economy and not have to react to market forces. As soon as you get this galactic market, the price of food could crash if you're buying lots of food. That could be great. 
or alternatively you're buying 100 food each month but suddenly everyone else is and then the price of food is skyrockets and your entire civilization collapses because it can no longer feed itself because it's so expensive to buy apples. Don't ask me why it's apples, everyone loves the apples. That wraps it up for Galactic Community here. Uh, there's also one thing though I haven't mentioned which is the Form Galactic Council. You have to wait 20 years before proposing this, you can't become the custodian without this, and the Galactic Council is really where it's at. That's going to allow you to start having all sorts of cool and interesting, uh, all sorts of cool and interesting things that will be giving you special powers. You can you can propose emergency resolutions, you can veto resolutions, you get extra diplomatic weight, uh, you know, and later on it will reform. If you reform into the first Galactic Empire, it will change from Galactic Council to uh, the Imperial... Goodness me, I've forgotten what it's called. Somebody comment down below what the Im it's called in the Empire, would you please? Due to the fact I have a very friendly neighbor here uh, who has a superior fleet power to me, and actually I probably want to go back and think about improving relations again so I don't get too unfriendly. I'm For my third pick, I'm actually going to go with Diplomacy simply so that I can form a federation and start going through how federation works and how you want to be uh, looking at that. And that's where I'm going to leave it for this episode. If you've enjoyed it, please leave a like. If you have any feedback for me, please leave a comment. And if you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe.